Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. A United Nations gauge of global food prices are now at a 10-year high, with prices soaring due to a confluence of factors, from bad weather um, that has hurt harvests, supply chains uh, that have been hit by higher shipping rates and worker shortages, and fertilizer and pesticide costs have surged as well. But are these international conditions the source of the sudden and sometimes dramatic spikes in local food prices? MP for Kulimbanda Baru, Dato Sri Saifuddin Nasution Ismail, joins us now. Saifuddin, as a former Minister of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, you know the system, you know its capacity, its capabilities, but you also know its limitations. Now, I'm just wondering, when we're referring to the rise in food prices, what kind of mechanisms are available to government uh, to monitor or to regulate the prices of essential items uh, in different parts of the country? Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wani, for inviting me. Uh, I would start with the uh, uh, the fact that uh, the low income group people normally will spend more on food. For every hundred ringgit they earn, for example, uh, forty percent or forty ringgit will be spent for food. So that explains why, uh, in the current situations. Uh, uh, people out there are relatively angry about the uh, uh, the price of uh, goods, you know. Uh, take uh, chicken and cooking oil, for example. Those are the two obvious, uh, uh, the two items that obviously see the uh, price increase. So to answer your question, uh, uh, Melissa, uh, I would uh, go into the uh, short-term uh, solution that actually government can look into. Um, cooking, oil, uh, cooking oil, for example, due to the increase of uh, CPO price, uh, now is at uh, 5,200 ringgit. There is no way for the uh, cooking oil price can be reduced except for, uh, for the government to provide uh, or to give more uh, subsidy. Uh, for this year, for example, government uh, 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 plan to spend about of 400 million ringgit. This is for next year budget. But this year alone, um, when I uh, discussed with the uh, Minister of Finance, he did mention that for the cooking oil subsidy scheme for this year alone, government has spent about 1 billion ringgit. So how do you, uh, uh, how do you overcome this problem? So we produce about 20 million ton of uh, CPO every year. But for the cooking oil, uh, we spend about 1 million ton to produce cooking oil. And uh, for the cooking oil uh, scheme subsidy, for example, uh, uh, we produce about 60,000 metric ton uh, for the people of Malaysia. And this is to keep the price at 2 ringgit and 50 cent. But uh, at the CPO uh, price at 5,200, how do you keep the price at 250? Obviously, by giving up more subsidy but um uh, but sorry, billion... can I, so, sorry yeah. can i get you that i understand especially because uh this uh, these issues become a political um hot potato uh, when when the b40 is suffering so much already uh to put an extra burden in terms of food uh is in fact uh, unconscionable but i want to ask you about the mechanism you talk about government subsidies there's a lot of criticisms that the, this is not the way to do it that in yeah we, we can you know, we can you, open uh, the the solution would be everyone yeah or yeah. you know giving the poor coupons uh, some are subsidizing or helping them cope with these price rises but instead of uh, intervening in the market well uh, at this stage Shiraz, let's agree that uh, subsidy is the most effective way on uh, to keep the price uh, low okay so it can yeah, be but the in subsidies the form of... go to the rich as well no wouldn't the subsidy go to the rich as well unfortunately it's not targeted i think that's the criticism Yes, I do agree with you. Uh, the element of uh, enforcement and then the targeted subsidy. But uh, here, uh, I, I, I talk about uh, uh, the uh, subsidy is uh, one of the mechanism 
uh, that is within the government capability uh, to keep the cooking oil subsidy at the uh, low price. That's one way. Uh, let's move on the uh, chicken price. Number. The uh, chicken price now is, uh, to me, is crazy, you know. When I was a minister, we try our level best to keep that the price at below seven ringgit. And that is my way of uh, having a, a consistent dialogue with the poultry industries. But now at five, uh, nine ringgit and 50 cents, and sometimes you reach up to 10, 10 ringgit, for example. And this is due to the increase of uh, soybean, you know, and uh, uh, and corn. You know? Okay, uh, on that yeah. note, then how much how much um, can government influence that? Uh, because I I see you know uh, comments being made that the middlemen have been made the scapegoat, have uh, have been blamed for the increase in prices. Is it down to uh, to communication and negotiation between? A supplier and the government to keep these prices down? Well, I don't dispute that, uh, Melissa, but uh, let me explain to you that um, I'm more inclined on how best can government assist on this. Uh, as a member of opposition, I did uh, view my, my opinion, give my opinion in parliament recently. You know, In fact, yesterday, I had a good session with the Minister of Domestic Trade, uh, uh, Alexander Lingi, you know, in fact, I propose that government should consider to provide soft loan uh, to the poultry industries, uh, uh, farmers, you know, that produce chicken, for example. And then the, uh, the output-based subsidies also can be um, explored. And these are the two ways that I think most possible way to keep the price out, uh, to, to, please, uh, to keep the price down for uh, chicken. And on top of that, the Akta Kawalan Harga and anti pencatutan which is to control the price uh, during the festive season. Um, my uh, proposal is that for the government to take into consideration that uh, December, we are going to have uh, uh, Christmas, and then early next year is Chinese New Year, followed by uh, Ari Raya Puasa. So um, uh, if, let's say, we, we keep uh, 20 days uh, for the government to implement the price control for Hari Raya Puasa, Chinese New Year, Christmas, Deepa Bali, and Gawai, all together would be 100 out of 365 days a year. And please keep into top 15 uh, items, the top uh, popular items among the consumers. And those are minyak masa, you know, uh, beras, uh, and uh, so on, you know. So okay. by, uh, by having this uh, Akta Kawalan Harga and Pencatutan, so, and then to increase the numbers of days and items, these are the way, the short term uh, solution that can give uh, a peop uh, can can uh, can keep the price low uh, for the okay. benefits of uh, people at large. Thank you so much. Datuk Sri Saifuddin Nasution Ismail, MP for Kulim Bandabaru there, um, talking about some of the short term measures government can do. After this, we're going to come and take, well, we're going to take a look at some of the longer term measures to address what's happening right now with food prices. Stay tuned to consider this. Jadi kesinambungan perpaduan tanah air yang tercinta, berteraskan adab yang terpahat di jiwa dan raga. Marilah bersama kita membina negara Malaysia. Untuk memastikan Malaysia ada ke depan dan maju. Induknya adalah Melayu. Malik kepada sesiapa orang yang membuat polisi. Kalau itu yang dia kehendaki, fine. Mungkin kita berbeza pandangan. Tapi kita mempunyai kuasa yang boleh menentukan budaya di masa hadapan. 
polisi yang mesra wanita sudah tentu dia akan datang daripada pemimpin wanita. Asrama Mahat Tahfiz Jaaban. Bila sentuh soal berita, tiada masa untuk tunggu. Kepada anda kami bawakan fakta, susulan dan kupasan yang terkini. Tiada drama dan tiada pengulangan. Usah tunggu lama-lama. Awani 745 lebih awal dari biasa. Hi, you're watching Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me is Sharad Kutin. We're discussing the rise in food prices, the reasons for the increase, and also the necessary interventions needed to address them. Dr. Serena Cheoma is Deputy Director of Research at Kazna Research Institute, where she focuses on policies related to food, agriculture and sustainability. Dr. Serena, um, a lot has been said about the reasons uh, behind the rising food prices, but maybe you can um, share what you understand to be the reason behind um, all this concern. Right. Thanks, Melissa. Now, food prices have indeed increased quite drastically recently, especially vegetable and chicken prices within Malaysia. For example, clean raw chicken from 8 ringgit to 10 ringgit per kilogram, and in some vegetables such as bok choy, it went up from 3 ringgit to 9 ringgit. Now, there, can, there are various contributing factors for sure, such as the increase in demand due to the opening of the economy, increase in labour costs and limited supply of foreign labour and transport issues. But one key thing that I think is pushing the, and driving prices up is the phenomenal rise in global fertiliser prices throughout 2021. Now, to produce food, we need fertilizers, right, to grow vegetables as well as to grow crops for animal feed. Now, in 2021, throughout 2021, there has been a surge in the prices of global fertilizers, the highest since 2008. And China, which is one of the world's largest exporters of urea, a key component of fertilizer, they experienced a surge in coal prices. And that has caused the urea prices across the world to go up. Now, to give you an example, price of urea in October was at 600 USD per metric ton, which is 60% year on year. So it is crazy how everything that happens in this world is so interlinked. And it is therefore not surprising that prices of our local vegetables, which rely on fertilizers, imported fertilizers, increase. Um, there has Serena, also been sorry, a, sorry, yeah. sorry, Serena, if I could just uh, ask you, uh, before we get sure. to the question of food security and our, our you know, uh, position within the global supply chain in terms of food, can I ask you whether prices, in your opinion, will come down? I mean, these prices have gone up. Could they possibly come down when, uh, when uh, demand uh, for uh, fertilizers is met with increased supply or something like that? Thanks, Gerard. Now, actually, experts do think, now, all over the world, they do think that prices of fertilizer will recover in 2022. Likely. I won't say will. I said likely. But whether that translates to lowering food prices, I cannot say for sure, but I do hope so. Right. And you talked, you mentioned bok choy and you also talked about prices of uh, of raw chicken. Can I ask you why these uh, are... are Foods specifically uh, related to the high uh, costs of fertilizers and pesticides in China, is that the only cat food category of essential items that will be impacted by um, increased prices? Melissa, you're talking about chicken and vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. And are you, are you saying whether other food items would be impacted as well? Correct, yes. Is it only okay. ch uh, chicken and vegetables? All right. Here's the unique thing about the Malaysian um, food environment in, in Malaysia is that, number one, it is the way the food is produced, right? Some food, you can plant them in different seasons. Some food have different, um, what you call it, life cycle, and there's different regulations as well. Now, to give you an example, typically vegetables and poultry takes about just six to 
10 weeks to grow. Now, compare that to tropical trees like durian that takes 10 years or cows, years to mature. So these longer-term um, crops and fruit will take longer, so they won't be impacted as much. Now, another very important thing is rice, right? Uh, will we be impacted? Now, the unique thing about the Malaysian uh, rice environment is that we are highly regulated. And, for example, uh, the fertilizers, it's highly subsidized. So farmers in the paddy industry, uh, it's because it's subsidized, they are not impacted by fertilizer prices. Now, when we go to the consumer end, uh, the price of rice, has a ceiling price of one ringgit sixty to one ringgit eighty per kilogram. Therefore, it's not impacted. And another very interesting thing about meat is that meat is imported, but it is imported in bulk, frozen. That means as the, um, the the suppliers can control the supply better because you know as demand changes, everything is frozen. You can just take out whatever you need, and which is why meat is a little bit more stable. And that's why you see our chicken and vegetables, which has to be so fresh with shorter lifespan, they are much more volatile. Serena, is the solution uh, in part on uh, in the hands of the consumer, basically? When prices go up on certain items, you just shift your, your, cons uh, your consumption habits. You buy what is cheaper rather than what is expensive in the market. Well, that's a very tough question. I mean, it's very easy to say for consumers with a choice, but sometimes we have communities that don't have much of a choice, Sherrod, and therefore it, it's an in, a very delicate interplay between what the government can do and what we expect consumers to be more prudent. It's a bit of a balance between the two. And what, what um, mechanisms or interventions do you think are available to government? We've, there's been a lot of debate about the, the merits or the dangers of, uh, of, a, uh, of a ceiling crisis. What do you think, Serena, are there, what do you think, what government interventions do you think are necessary at this point? Okay, there are two measures, two very broad measures. Short-term stopgap measures, which is still important because we do not want it to be really drastically impacting our people. And we have long-term measures, which is important and we must be committed to it. Now, short-term, there can be two solutions. Number one, which is where I'm leaning more towards, is financial assistance to the producers, especially our, our poultry as well as vegetable producers. Um, but with a big but. There must be an exit clause. Now, governments, politicians, are, they are under pressure to introduce um, intervention, but sometimes they forget to introduce exit clause. And what's the exit clause? It means that, okay, we will help give you fertilizer subsidies on condition if the prices go below a certain amount, then we will stop producing, uh, stop giving the subsidy. Same goes with ceiling prices. We must be absolutely careful because in most of the time, 9 out of 10, when governments introduce ceiling prices over the long term, it actually backfires. What normally happens is that the quality of the product reduces. So we must be very careful if we want to implement ceiling prices, make sure there's, a, um, there's an exit clause and there's care to the implementation. Now, what about long term? Now, as you notice, we rely a lot. Now, even though our poultry is 100% self-sufficient, we rely almost more than 90% on imported animal feed, primarily corn. So what do we do, right? Does it mean that Malaysia should just now plant corn? Not necessarily. The question we should ask ourselves is, what alternatives can we produce that added value and have a competitive advantage versus corn, rather than us try to do another corn, right? And we can't beat all these other players in the industry. And the answer, the obvious answer, we do have the answer. Insect farming and palm kernel cake. So these are what we call alternative sources of protein for animal feed. And um, there's great potential. Malaysia can produce it because we have the greatest environment for it. Warm climate. We, are, we have a big palm oil production. All we need is the support from the government. We have our startups such as Bioloop and Unique Biotech. We need to support them so that we have more aerodynes such as the one in the drone industry. Right. Let's have that in the alternative feed industry. Thank you so much, Dr. Serena Chioma of Kazana Research Institute. We're going to take a quick break and more on this topic in just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
amanah di tangan kita Adat, budaya dan semangat Menjadi kesinambungan perpaduan tanah air yang tercinta Berteraskan adab yang terpahat di jiwa dan raga Marilah bersama kita membina negara Malaysia Untuk memastikan Malaysia ada ke depan dan maju Induknya adalah Melayu Balik dan Malaysia Orang yang membuat polisi Kalau itu yang dia kehendaki, fine Mungkin kita berbeza pandangan Tapi kita mempunyai kuasa yang boleh menentukan budaya di masa hadapan Polisi yang mesra wanita, sudah tentu dia akan datang daripada pemimpin wanita Asrama Mahat Tahfiz Jabal Bila sentuh soal berita Tiada masa untuk tunggu Kepada anda kami bawakan fakta Susulan dan kupasan yang terkini Tiada drama Dan tiada pengulangan Usah tunggu lama-lama Awani 7.45 Lebih awal dari biasa Hi, thanks so much for staying. Shrad and I on Consider This. Joining us now, we have Dr. Carmelo Polito, CEO of the Think Tank Center for Market Education. Dr. Carmelo, um, I'm wondering about the price increase, whether we were caught unaware by the, uh, the increase in prices of essential items. Did this catch us off guard because it escalated so quickly or was someone not paying attention? Did someone take their eye off the ball? Well, um, actually, if you uh, first of all, good evening and thanks for having me. Um, if you have uh, followed my statement, uh, I started to raise the flag about inflation uh, last March. So it's something that I think uh, uh, it had to be expected, um, and uh, mostly for uh, two reasons that are both um, uh, that can both uh, be tracked back to. Uh, policies that were implemented during uh, the COVID emergency, uh, in particular to lockdowns. Um, so lockdowns have brought disruptions in supply chain on one side, and on the other side, the need of uh, um, expansion in uh, the monetary the money supply. So under this perspective, uh, I think that uh, it was uh, it had to be expected. Kamel, could you help us understand the distinction between inflation as a general phenomena uh, and, in this instance, particular goods being subjected to spikes in uh, prices? Okay. Um, inflation, first of all, is always a, a monetary phenomenon at the very root. So um, we have to properly define inflation looking at that increase in the general level of prices that is uh, tracked back to an increase in money supply. Then we have different phenomena uh, that can happen as temporary phenomena uh, that are due to a spike in demand or to a shortage in supply. And these uh, can always be addressed. I mean, the market will always try and struggle to address uh, this uh, second uh, type of phenomena, but what instead we must call properly inflation is uh, an excess of money supply or, or when the money supply uh, grows uh, beyond uh, the growth of uh, output. And uh, this is very important because obviously we look at the general level of prices, but this alteration in the money supply also alters the structure of the relative prices, so how different products are priced in the relationship between them. And this alteration somehow creates more difficulties in taking sound decisions uh, from a, the entrepreneurial perspective and therefore create more frictions in the process of market coordination. And in the long run, uh, they can create serious dangers on uh, employment. 
I, I want to talk to you about what government can do to address situations like this in terms of uh, government interventions. You've argued before that price controls are not the way for government to address inflationary pressures. Can you explain why? Okay, uh, if we if we talk about the kind of tensions that are coming from the disruption in the supply chain, uh, putting a um, uh, price ceiling is just a way to hide the problem and to delay its solution, potentially creating more inflationary pressures once the price ceiling are removed, because meanwhile you have removed the incentive for supply to meet, uh, to meet demand. Uh, because if uh, production, if supply is not uh, incentivized to meet the demand, then obviously you, re you will remain in that situation of tension. So we should act at supply level, so try to find a way to improve the supply of that product uh, within the country so that uh, supply can meet demand. There are other tensions coming from the shortage of labor, and this is something that must uh, be addressed. Uh, there are certain uh, critical industries like F&B and manufacturing that desperately need uh, labor. And this is one point. And third point, which I keep on repeating, is confidence. Supply will not restructure to go back to pre-COVID level or anyhow to meet demand as far as business people are not confident that the situation is going to back also from the economic perspective. So as far as expectations are low, we will have this kind of uh, frictions. Instead Carmelo, of very quickly, sir, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. could you very quickly, in a, in a, in a concrete sense, tell us uh, what could be done in the short term, uh, policy-wise, uh, to address the issue of price increases? I mentioned special, uh, special trade corridors, first of all. So recognizing where the supply frictions are and do whatever is possible to bring supply in. Uh, secondly, to reopen to the um, hiring of foreign workers. And third, to send a clear message of confidence that we are not going uh, into uh, new lockdowns again. This is uh, uh, for the short term. For the long term, addressing the different kind of inflation, the monetary inflation that is the one that is more threatening uh, the stability of uh, uh, our economy, the, and not only our, but the world economy, the government should embark in a serious program of, uh, um, uh, in a serious program of uh, spending cuts. Okay. Dr. Kamala Felita, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Dr. Kamala Felita from the Centre for Market Education there, wrapping up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Gutten, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching the show. Have a great weekend, folks. Good night.